Well, good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to the Wisdom of the Soul from La Quinta, California, in the Low Desert, where the Sonoran Desert and the Mojave Desert come together, and uh, where it rained yesterday, which is a rare occurrence. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I'm really uh, looking forward to this class. We're going to define consciousness with two different models. Uh, the layers or levels of consciousness will be one model, and the states in which they express themselves another model. And in both cases, they are four bullet points. The uh, layers or levels of consciousness are four in number, and the states in which consciousness or awareness expresses itself are well, four in number in terms of brain waves. <laughs> There's a way you could look at it as three. But uh, enough of the uh, mysterious intro. We'll get to that soon. And what is consciousness? Well, in advance of our opening meditation here, let me just say it's awareness, um, it's intelligence, it's insight and understanding its comprehension, and it also has uh, values and ethics enfolded within it. So consciousness is a lot. It's a big word. It's uh, not used as often as it should be, perhaps. And when it is, we think in very simple terms of being either unconscious, like asleep or in a coma, or consciously awake, aware, and responsive. Awake, aware, and responsive. But as you'll find out today, there's more to it than that, as you probably suspected. And I have a math problem, a fun little, well, it's not a problem, a fun little, uh, in fact, it's not even math, it's just simple arithmetic, but it's a fun little uh, uh, enigmatic puzzle that... Uh, you may want to share with your friends. It's a bit of a brain teaser, and I'll use it to demonstrate a, a phenomenon of consciousness. So we have all that in store, our opening meditation, and uh, at the end of the class today, at about noon or uh, soon thereafter, maybe noon 10 or so, we'll go to the Q&A. So what I'd suggest is if at any time during the class, a uh, question pops into your mind, put it in the chat box then. Put it in the chat box right away while you're thinking about it. And um, then when we get to the Q&A part, and Melinda reads these, we'll give you an option to unmute if you wish and go further, or I'll just respond to the question as, as stated in the chat box. It's a Sunday morning where we are, Sunday afternoon, perhaps most likely wherever you are. A lot of folks prefer to keep their videos off, and that's just fine. Uh, I'd like you to stay muted, and then uh, again, when we go to the Q&A, you can each unmute yourselves. You have that ability. So let's do an opening med. What do you say? Opening meditation, opening focus. So I want you to get comfortable in your chairs, sit up, don't slouch, and uh, think of yourself as balanced and centered and aligned. Drop your shoulders, let them fall back to open up the rib cage. Balance your head on your neck and shoulders. As you begin to create and sense a feeling of relaxation, a letting go feeling of muscles relaxing. Feel them unwinding. Feel the letting go from head to toe. Feeling so safe, even where you are. And the safety of this next 10 minutes. 
to close your eyes. Do that now if you haven't already. Turning away from sense and sensation. Toward your body. And just feel yourself in your body. Most of us dwell most of the time in our heads. We sit behind our eyes. We sit between our ears. And right in front of us is our ability to smell fragrance and taste flavor. All of those senses are clustered close to the brain. And then you have a kinesthetic or tactile sense, the ability to reach out and touch or to feel touched everywhere on your body, anywhere on your body. If you were barefoot in the backyard, it's likely you'd feel an ant crawl across your toes. It's a remarkable, uh, truly remarkable ability that we have. There are other senses. There's a sense of balance, the interior sense, the ability to, with your eyes closed, put your finger on the tip of your nose without missing. <laughs> how, how do you do that? Or the awareness of you're hungry or you need to go to sleep. Those are senses as well. And so by sitting quietly with your eyes closed, by relaxing and feeling or letting go, we actually become more aware, not less. But by reducing external stimulus, we awaken to awareness of who and what we are as awareness itself. You are the here and now. You are the awareness that you exist. Descartes is famous for having said, I think, therefore I am. In other words, he knew he existed because of his ability to think. That postulate has been used as a kind of a touchstone ever since. I know I exist, I can think. But consider those times when you, oh, let's say, attempt to remember something maybe a name of someone you once knew, and you draw a blank. Your mind goes blank for a moment or two, and yet you remain. You don't suddenly fall asleep. You don't pass out or go unconscious. You sit there with a blank mind, aware that you're not thinking and that your mind is going blank. So Descartes was close, but incorrect. I am aware, therefore I am. I am that. I am the awareness. Now, sometimes we're not very aware. We go through life robotically and habitually. Our decision-making goes to autopilot. <clears throat> Our responses are often reflexive in nature. With no thought whatsoever until after the fact, and then we attempt to defend or rationalize the behavior that came out of reflex without any thought whatsoever, maybe out of an emotion, 
like anger or fear, without any thought whatsoever. Unconscious behavior. So it's in our interest to learn to be more conscious all the time. And that's the idea of mindfulness in the present moment. Mm. We've touched on mindfulness in the past. Of course, we'll speak about it more in the future. But the whole point of mindfulness is to be here now. <laughs> The only thing that's real is what's happening right now. The past, your memory, your recollections of it are merely images in your mind. They have no substance. There is no past, per se. And so to the future, images, fantasies, maybe positive, maybe negative, most likely a blend. But still, images in the mind, how could you say that's real? There's nothing real about the past or the future. These are constructs, like time itself. A construct. The present moment unfolds. The present moment has a rhythm. It has an in-breath and an out-breath. It has a sense of a coming and a going to it. But eternity, and for that matter, infinity, is in the unfolding, the perpetual unfolding of the present moment. Does that not help you slow down? Does that not give you a sense that you have all the time you need? that you're not really going anywhere, ever. For wherever you happen to be, there you are. It's always now and it's always here. And of course, we can learn from the past and we can plan the future. We have schedules and date books. We have clocks and watches. But all of that, recalling and planning, the watching of time pass, it all happens in the present moment. It's the only place anything ever can happen. <clears throat> it's right here, right now. So what's the hurry? Ask yourself, as you sit here quietly, why am I in a hurry so much of the time? Why do I suffer the delusion that if only I worked a little harder and a little faster and was a little more conscientious, I could somehow catch up. I would reach the end of my to-do list. And then I could relax. Surely you know there is no end to the to-do list. 
<laughs> Nobody's ever reached the end of their to-do list. So the question remains, what's your hurry? We touched on this last week. When you see people speeding on the freeway or find yourself caught up in the rush, is it that everybody is hurrying along in order to get to some place that they need to be? Or is it more likely that we're all running away? From what we do not know, toward what we're not really sure. But we run and we run and we exhaust ourselves, hurrying to try to get to some place for some reason. And we have no idea what that is. Peace, you say. Happiness, contentment, fulfillment. Is that where we're going? Is that what we're rushing off to get to? If only I had a little more money, fewer bills, less debt. Only I understood on other people. If only I could figure this stuff out. Then I could get to a place of peace and happiness and contentment and fulfillment. And here's the good news, my friends. All of that is with you at all times. I did a radio interview this week. And the host of the radio program said to me at one point, how do we create more peace in our lives? And I said, it's a funny thing. We don't need to create peace. We already have it. And so too, happiness and joy, happiness for no reason, joy. And contentment and fulfillment is always with you in the core of your being. But there's so much junk piled on top of it, so much busy, busy, busy. A sense of identity. How am I like other people? How am I different from other people? What do these other people think of me? Who am I really and what am I for? Why am I here? How do I get out of here? <laughs> Where would I go? What would I do? There's nothing to attain. There's nothing to accomplish. There is no destination. Rumi said it best, I think. I love this line from Rumi. Yours is not to seek and find love, but to release everything that stands in its way. Letting go, letting go, letting go of this, putting down that, turning this over, releasing that, accepting the limits of your power, your control, and your ability to influence can be difficult. But it leaves us with peace. And it feels like, what if you knew everything was okay, exactly as it is, and you are right on schedule, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, 
What if that were true? And what if you knew it was true? That there's no place you need to be but right here and right now. Not really. Feel as if there's nowhere you'd rather be but safe with your awareness of thought, feeling, and condition. I am that awareness. And everything's just fine. And I'm right on schedule. And everything's okay exactly as it is. And unfolding exactly as it should. In its own order. In its own time. And you have to consider the possibility that that may be true to experience it. And then the truth reveals itself. Everything is okay. And when some part of your mind argues that it's not, take another look. Not in normal consciousness, but with the expanded awareness of deep relaxation. To accept the present moment gives you the power to create in due time the growth, the fulfillment, purpose of life is to live it in the moment for no reason other than to experience uniquely a life that no one else has ever lived, that no one else ever will live. And though there is a great deal of overlap and intersection, each of us lives a unique life. Celebrate that uniqueness. What a gift. The best seat in the house. Gently embrace that opportunity and find your fulfillment there. For no reason other than to be aware. Let's use the affirmation today, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. It's a wonderful, universal affirmation. Good for what ails you. Repeat it a couple of times silently to yourself. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Sitting right here, right now, in the present moment, mindfully aware of my evolution, of my unfoldment, of my growth. Better and better every day in every way. Days, years, lifetimes. Better and better every day in every way. Believe it. If you're in a bad mood and have a hard time accepting that for some reason, consider it a possibility. What if? 
What if my attitudes and beliefs made a difference? Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. And bring that awareness with you as you form the intention now to return slowly to the waking state. Two, feeling a gentle floating up feeling, like a helium balloon floating slowly into the sky, floating upward toward the waking state. Three, open your eyes wide awake, wide awake now, eyes open, back in the room, feeling fine, refreshed and rested, much better than before, feeling better than before. Good. Welcome back. The only element I left out of that meditation when it comes to mindfulness, and we'll talk more about this in the future, is non-judgment. And that's a huge area, non-judgment. But mindfulness is basically to sit in the present moment, to consider the full reality of the present moment. without any judging. Like we were talking uh, just a few minutes ago, or I, was, I, I mentioned that it rained here. Uh, depending on my mood and my attitudes and my beliefs and my intentions, um, I might have said, whoopee, oh boy, it's raining. It's a desert. It never rains here. We really need this rain. Yippee-io. And... Uh, Somebody else who was planning to go outside or maybe just wash the car, you know, or wanted to go for a picnic, they might be brought down by the rain. And so they judge the rain as a bad thing. Oh, no, damn it, it rained. But the rain, <laughs> the rain is the rain. There's no benefit in judging it as good or bad. And <clears throat> How many other things in our lives do we insist on judging as right or wrong or good or bad when we really have no idea of the full scope of the consequences or the reasons for things to be? And the challenge of accepting, especially Westerners, Europeans and Americans, we think that acceptance is the end of things. That acceptance means surrender, give up, throw in the towel. And it doesn't. Acceptance is not the end of things. Acceptance is where you begin. Acceptance is to acknowledge reality. The here and now. It is what it is. And I can't tell you how much grief that will spare you <laughs> in the long run. <clears throat> when you learn to accept reality and acknowledge it. There's a story of a monk who was, um, have I told this story? I'm not sure. There's, there's a story of a monk that was admiring a fine crystal goblet, beautiful, hand-blown crystal glass goblet. And it was hundreds of years old, and it was, obviously crafted by a, a magnificent glass blower, an artesian who certainly knew what he or she was doing. And the monk is holding it up to the light and looking at the way the, the light dances through it and the different colors that come off the, this fine piece of uh, glassware. And then Accidentally, he drops it, and it shatters in a million pieces. And being a monk, he said, of course. This is accepting the law of impermanence, <laughs> which is when it comes to accepting one of the big ones. Nothing lasts, everything passes. But that's, you know, we would blame ourselves, wouldn't we? We'd begin to do demean ourselves and say, oh, I'm so clumsy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I feel so guilty. Can I pay you for this? Oh, it's irreplaceable. Money won't replace it. 
Well, maybe it doesn't need to be replaced. Maybe it just lived its life. You see? My mother used to say again and again, I've heard her voice echoing in my mind throughout my life. For all the truly wise things she said, here was one that I had a big problem with. And she said, if you take care of this, Michael, whatever it was, if you take care of this, it'll last forever. No, it's not true. <laughs> it's, it's just not true. So accepting the impermanence of things is a big part of mindfulness, isn't it? To live in the present moment. Today, we're going to talk about consciousness as that awareness. Consciousness and awareness are essentially uh, interchangeable words. They're, they're synonyms for each other, right? And if I had to go to a third word, I'd probably go to understanding, that awareness and consciousness means understanding. But it's even more than that. I've attempted to make lists of the qualities of consciousness. Uh, it's got to be a very long list. And then it just started to lose its meaning. And I realized consciousness is everything. Consciousness is the only thing. Consciousness is reality. Nothing is more fundamental to our existence than our awareness of it. It's the one thing you cannot get behind. You can get behind your thoughts, can't you? And, and why am I thinking along these lines? Oh, well, this is a pattern. I always think this way. Well, why? Where did I learn to do that? Oh, I, because when I was 14, this happened, and uh, I was scarred and traumatized by it. And, you know, I've never really trusted anybody since then. Or it could be one of a million other stories. But why do I think the way I think? Consciousness. Somebody asked me once the difference between consciousness and awareness. This was back in the early 80s, and I was on the radio in the middle of the night, and it just got thrown at me. I thought, oh my God, what a great question. I'm not sure I know the answer. <laughs> I was really on the spot. Hey, Michael, what's the difference between consciousness and intelligence? And uh, I took a breath, and I relaxed, and heard myself say, I mean, I was speaking stream of consciousness, so to speak. So it's not like I thought this through and then said it. I was live on the radio. <laughs> I didn't have time to do that. So as I was becoming aware of it, my response, I was speaking it in the moment. And I heard myself say, uh, an example would be inventing and building a nuclear weapon. It takes great intelligence to do such a thing, but a conscious person would never be part of such a project. Mass murder on an unbelievable scale, vaporizing hundreds of thousands of innocent non-combatants in an instant, uh, risking thermonuclear chain reaction, fallout that we don't understand. It's just un unconscionable that human beings would build such a thing and use it, not once but twice. And people say, well, it was done to end the war. Yeah, well, it could have been demonstrated uh, 10 miles high and not done very much damage other than the fallout. It could have been demonstrated in a way that, look, we have this horrible weapon. We're going to use it if you don't comply and, and uh, give up, surrender. But no, we brought it down low. <laughs> Whatever the cities, conscious, a conscious person could not participate in that. 
though they might be very intelligent. So finding synonyms for consciousness or awareness, like understanding or intelligence, is difficult. And even the two words, depending on who you ask, are slightly different. And so this is where we begin to talk today about the layers or levels of consciousness. And I'm going to work backwards, so to speak, saying that the outermost layer, we'll start outside and work inside, the outermost layer of consciousness is the mind, our ability to think, our ability to feel, our ability to consider an action and initiate it, though the tendency is often to be reflexive and to react with very little thought. Depends on the situation, of course. But that's the outer layer or level of consciousness is the mind, the human mind. This is Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I can read, I can write, I can cipher, I can use numbers, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, (laughs) <laughs> that rocket ship they sent up a couple of years ago to hit the asteroid, see if they could nudge it out of the orbit, just in case one was ever headed our way. Could we do that? They had to shoot a rocket, uh, what it was it, a year and a half in advance, at a point where the asteroid would then be, not where it is now. It's like, you know, Shooting a duck, you don't shoot at the duck. You shoot ahead of it. Hopefully, you're not shooting anything, but you got to lead it. You know what I'm saying? And the calculus involved in that, the math, to be able to fly by, what was the planet? We've flown by all of the planets, including Pluto. It's just unbelievable to see film on your living room television of a flyby over Pluto. It's just in our lifetimes. So the ability to think, to read, to write, to use numbers and higher math, it's just to build computers, to to build automobiles and rocket ships and boats and planes is just extraordinary. There is a deeper level of consciousness below thought and feeling, and that's sense and sensation. So the next level of consciousness, the third level, so to speak, is uh, the senses we talked about earlier, my ability to see uh, when my eyes are open, my ability to hear, to, to taste, smell, and touch, as well as uh, awareness of what's going on inside my body. Gee, I'm hungry. Gosh, I'm so tired. Forgive me, i got to visit the restroom. How do you know these things? That's a sense. I'll ask Melinda later the term for that. Procipiation or something. She'll know. Melinda, remind me to ask you that later. And um, so this is the third level of consciousness, our sense and sensation. Going deeper, the second level of consciousness you may find the most strange. And this is the store. It's called a store. Um, Think of it as a warehouse. This is the level, now you're going to have to stretch a little bit with me. This is where forms and qualities, ethics and values live. Again, it's like a warehouse. This is where the form that you call tree in English. That's a tree. It's very different than the, this, this fir tree is very different than this palm tree, very different than this oak tree, very different than this birch tree, this bamboo. Oh, the bamboo is not a tree. The bamboo is grass. 
and then we have different kinds of grasses. And so it is with everything that we've labeled and named. Not only the forms, but the quality. Water is wet, and it freezes at 32 degrees. Laws of physics, for example, are in this store. It freezes at 32 degrees on a scale called Fahrenheit 0 Celsius. It boils at 212 Fahrenheit 100 Celsius centigrade. Um, the qualities of, of fire, um, the various elements of the periodic table, these things exist as qualities, or how can I say this? Uh, it's like the skeleton of up upon which reality is hung, or the scaffolding upon which physical dense is built. And these are names and forms that exist in the second level of consciousness, the warehouse or the store. Our values are in here, our ethics, our conscience, our decision that this is noble, this is wholesome, this is good. What's that based on? Or that this is horrible, that's, that's wicked, that's evil, you should never do that. Uh, that's against the laws of nature and man. That's contrary to all that is good and true and beautiful. Says who? I mean, sure, there's a lot of room for disagreement, but still there is a consensus. You won't find very many people that think that random shooting or killing of other people is okay. Some people might say, well, I'm opposed to murder, but we got to have war and capital punishment, I think, is a good thing. Well... So people will disagree. But then there are those things upon which people do not disagree that everybody finds absolutely abhorrent or, on the other hand, exceedingly beautiful and, and, and worthy and valuable and wonderful. And so this larger consensus is part of this. I mean, this is everything. This is the the blueprints, so to speak, of physical dense reality, or as I said, the skeleton or scaffolding. Uh, <coughs> think of a Christmas tree. That's all nicely decorated, and it's got all the Christmas lights on it, and it's got the bulbs and the ornaments on it. And uh, gosh, back in the day, we used to do those uh, icicles, those semi-metallic, shiny silvery icicles <laughs> or I remember as a kid making uh, uh, popcorn and cranberry strands that we would hang on the tree then you'd put a bird or an angel on the top of the tree well underneath all of that is just a green fir tree right but when you see the Christmas tree all decorated you tend to forget about just that green tree that somebody chopped down in a forest or more likely a Christmas tree plantation <laughs> and sold you to take home and decorate. So underneath the substance of physical dense things, there has to be some sort of design. Why do humans all look basically the same with, you know, a torso that has a head on top of it and these four other appendages, arms and legs sticking out of it. Who decided on that shape? Right? Now, how did that evolve from the, uh, from the microbes, the single cell life, to more complex structures? It's pretty fascinating stuff. All those forms would exist in the second level of consciousness the store, or the warehouse. And then the first level is Brahman. 
And what I mean by that is God, Allah, the Great Spirit, the Creator, the Source, the Absolute, the Godhead, the Prime Mover, the First Cause. Do you want more? <laughs> you sort of get the idea. This is the most fundamental level of consciousness. And it's generally thought of in the literature, and this is a little contradictory, uh, but I think merits some reflection. This level, in terms of appearance, is a void, a unbelievably dark blackness that shines brightly. If you can imagine inky blackness shining brightly. Granted, it's a, you know, apparent contradiction. But sit with it for a minute. The ancient rishis from time out of mind said this. Many uh, NDE people, you know, near-death experience people, um, talk about at some point in their near-death experience witnessing this void, this inky blackness that shines so brightly that attempting to look at it is like staring at the sun, except it's all black. Um, Evan Alexander talks about this in his book, about his near-death experience called Proof of Heaven, this is a neurosurgeon. His father was a Harvard-educated neurosurgeon. He is a Harvard-educated neurosurgeon. He got a bacterial infection that ate away the cortex of his brain. And he was in a coma for seven days. And when he came back, unable to speak, unable to move, unable to recognize anybody, even his family, Unable to identify himself, it took months and months for all of that to begin to return slowly, even his ability to speak. And then he began to recount his experience during that seven days, which to him was a hundred years. I mean, he said he couldn't believe it was only seven days given what he went through. And, um, you know, I've interviewed a lot of fascinating people in my life in 50 plus years of radio. He's at the top. He's, he's got to be, I mean, just so intelligent, so well-educated. And uh, then having had to face this experience and, and the, the reality of the experience that he knew was not a dream. By a neurosurgeon, somebody who really knows the brain and the spine really, really well, who understands the neurons and who, like most other empirical scientists, had assumed that consciousness was a byproduct of brain chemistry. And he now knows that's just absurd, that uh, the brain is a product, like all physical things, of consciousness. All physical things exist in consciousness. Consciousness is primary. Awareness, consciousness, is fundamental to existence. The brain doesn't create consciousness. Consciousness creates everything. So, we want to understand it, right? So these are the four levels. Now, when we talk about Advaita Vedanta, and I've touched on it, again, promising to speak more on non-duality in the future, I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with the concept, though not found in the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It is found everywhere else, in the religions of the East and in the mystical traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
we see this understanding that ultimately, spiritually, consciousness is non-differentiated. All right? Consciousness is whole. It's one. It's not just one God, separate, living outside its creation. There's only one thing. Only one thing happening here. And it is imminent and transcendent. That one thing, consciousness, awareness, is in all things. Imminent. Not imminent, like about to happen, but immanent, meaning inherent or innate. Consciousness, awareness, is also transcendent, meaning every seemingly separated thing is within this unified field, this energy, magnetic energy field called the universe. So the one is in everything and everything is in the one. That's panentheism, as we discussed a few months ago. Imminent and transcendent. Now, that creates a bit of a, a, of, a, of a puzzle. Because here we are living in a world that we perceive through the third and fourth levels of consciousness our sense and sensation, the third level, the mind, what we think and feel on the fourth outermost level. And all these separated objects, excuse me, I'm going to have a separated sip of coffee from my clearly independent and separated coffee cup. So we live in a world of separated forms that rises out of non-duality. How could that be? How can the one create the many without being less than it was? How can the one manifest all these different forms without being diminished? See? How does the creator create all of this and not be less than as a result, or at least tired or used up somehow? How does non-duality give rise to dualism? Gender, yin and yang, positive and negative, good and bad, right and wrong, winners and losers, Republicans and Democrats, communism and capitalism. Aren't you just sick of the simplicity of dualism? And there's a wonderful little story that I'm going to share with you today, a kind of a simple arithmetic problem that helps to illustrate this. And um, you may want to share this with your friends. You know that old saying, he who teaches or she who teaches learns twice. The teacher learns twice. So it's fun to share this with other people. So the story comes out of Eastern philosophy that there was a king who had three sons. And as he got older and knew he was going to leave his kingdom to his sons, he gathered them together, a family meeting, and he said to the oldest son, to you I shall give half of my kingdom. To the second son he said, to you I will give one-third of my kingdom. And to the third son he said, and to you, my boy, you will receive one-ninth of the kingdom. One-half to the oldest son, one-third to the middle boy, one-ninth to the third son. Apparently the king did not have any daughters. Well, as uh, time went on and the king passes away, uh, the boys get together and they're going to divvy up the kingdom. But though things go, for the most part, rather smoothly, the king has 17 elephants. And they say, what are we going to do? Because I can't divide 17 in half. And the middle boy says, well, I, I, 
I don't, how do I get a third of 17 elephants? And the third boy, the youngest, said, well, I'm in the same dilemma. I can't get one-ninth of 17. 17 is not divisible by 2, 3, or 9. So what are we going to do? But they had a friend, a wise man, who lived up the road, and he said, I'll give you an elephant. I have an elephant that I will loan you. They didn't know exactly what that meant. So he brought the 18th elephant by one afternoon. And the three boys got together and said, now we have 18 elephants. This is perfect. Um, I get, the oldest boy said, I get nine, half of those 18. I get nine elephants. And the middle boy says, well, I get a third of 18. That would be six elephants, right? Three goes into 18 six times. And the third boy, the youngest boy, says, well, this works out just fine because a ninth of 18 elephants is two elephants. So it worked out perfectly. Um, you get nine, that's half of 18. The middle boy gets six, that's a third of 18. And the youngest son gets two, which is a ninth of 18. But nine and six and two adds up to 17. And so the neighbor takes the 18th elephant and goes home. Now, you know, this is puzzling. And if you want to play around with this math, I'll give you a little secret. If you if you turn those uh, fractions into decimals, like a half is 0. 0.5 and a third is uh, 0. 0.33 and a ninth is 0. 0.111 and add those up, you'll understand why the 18th elephant was unnecessary. So here is a case of, how should we say, Something that doesn't really exist and yet needs to be, the 18th elephant. And so the argument in esoteric philosophy or in mysticism or in Eastern philosophy is that physical reality is like the 18th elephant. It's not real. It's essentially an illusion. It's a figment of our consciousness or awareness. It's real enough to trick us and fool us and have us dedicate ourselves to the acquisition of goodies, of stuff, right? And to fight and argue and, and even wage wars for the power and the, 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 the products, the goods and services of something that's essentially a dream, that 18th elephant. And yet, it was needed in order to settle the dispute because 17 elephants, as I said before, could not be divided in half, in thirds, or in ninths. All you had to do is add the imaginary 18th element, solves the problem, you get nine, you get six, you get two, which adds up to 17. But you couldn't have got there by dividing 17 by those numbers. Yeah, it's esoteric, but I think it's cool. I like it a lot. How often do we come to the realization in our lives that what we're struggling over, what's breaking our hearts, what's making life so difficult for us, what's blinding us to meaning, reason, and purpose is the stuff itself without any idea of what it results from, what it is a, a byproduct of, and the purpose of the whole psychodrama. Or, um, Doreen likes to call it the holodeck. I think that's a pretty good allegory. If you were a Star Trek, uh, uh, the second Star Trek series, 
with uh, uh, <laughs> I've forgotten his name already, uh, Patrick Stewart, Picard. Yeah, <laughs> make it so. Not the one with Kirk and Spark, but Picard, Deanna Troy, and Data, and that crew. They had a holodeck. They had a room you could go in and program to be an alternate reality, a three-dimensional magical space that they could go for rest and relaxation and entertainment. And it was a hologram. Have you ever seen a hologram? Have you ever seen a holograph, a real a two-dimensional object that appears to be 3D. And the funny thing about it is when you, when if you had a hologram on glass and you, you or a holograph and you drop it and it breaks into pieces, each piece will contain an image of the entire graphic from the unique perspective of that piece. Michael Talbot, who I met and had dinner with years and years and years ago, he died probably 15 years ago, wrote a book called The Holographic Universe. Michael Talbot wrote a lot of books on werewolves too. <laughs> Never got to talk to him about that. I was more fascinated in this holographic universe as a paradigm, as a, as a, yeah, as a paradigm, as a model, uh, as an allegory for physical dense reality. It's a hologram. It's being projected. Your life is being projected. You're the projector out into the world from the consciousness. Starting with Brahma, or God, this black, shiny, bright, too bright to look at directly, inky blackness, out of which all things rise. The store, number two, where all the images and names and objects and forms and rules of physics, the laws of math and science, the nature of the physical elements of the periodic table, and of course our sense of morality and ethics, our values. All of that is an inherent part of consciousness. Third level, sense and sensation, our ability to see, hear, touch, taste, smell, and on the fourth level, the awareness of our thinking, the awareness of our emotional feelings, and the awareness of our behavior, our actions in the world. I had a feeling this was about as far as I was going to get, so next week we'll talk about the states through which consciousness expresses itself. Okay? Um we will pick up on a discussion we had a few months ago about brain waves and compare brain wave states the beta alpha theta and delta brain wave states to these levels of consciousness as perceived by the truly ancient uh, rishis and adepts of uh, time out of mind from before there was even written language this material was known and understood by a handful of women and men. So we'll do the states of consciousness next week, okay? So levels of consciousness. Surely you must have, <laughs> surely you must have some comment or question about these four levels of uh, consciousness. That, that should be new material for pretty much everybody here. Everybody here. Uh, Melinda... Yes, Michael. What is that word for the sense within your body of hunger or tired or using the restroom or? Well, I the only thing that came up to for me was was proprioception, which is yeah. those little receptors, kinesthesia. Kinesthesia is the other one that we don't have to think about putting our foot down on the floor; we'd be exhausted. It because it the, it doesn't need to go centrally. It, it there are peripheral circuits that are like if we if we think a burner is hot and we go to reach for it and we we we, we reach back, but we we we, have, we don't even know yet because our our we've been programmed to be wary of it. So it's it's called I think you're mentioning you're referring to that. 
And would that also be the ability with eyes closed to put your finger on the end of your nose? That's exactly what it is, yeah. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Because we would be falling over all the time, those boys. <laughs> yeah, of and people that have medical conditions where they have impaired sensation in their feet, as you know, they tend to walk kind of flat footed. They they lose some of that. So it's it's really vital. And that yes. I found out yes. I found out from an architect that's why stairs are designed at a certain height. They're to code because it messes with our proprioceptors. If if every stair were a different height, we we would uh, we would fall. Excellent. Yeah, proprioception. That's mm -hmm. what that's called. I I put it in my book, but I didn't have time to look it up. And I actually I think there's one other. I think there may be two kinds of proprioception. One having more to do with balance, but I'd I'd have to you know, it's funny, you write a book, you think you remember what you wrote in the book, but I'd have, <laughs> I'd have to look it up again. But there are more than the five senses that we talk about. That's my point. So is uh, do we have any comments or questions in the chat box, Mindy? Yes, we do. I wanted to interject real quickly. What I've take, started doing is I've started looking up the topic that you send on Saturday, and I've started to do a little pre-reading on it, and it has really helped uh, me to follow what you're talking about. That's a great idea. Yeah. And Hannah does have a comment, question or comment. Well, I, uh, sort of, yeah. I, it, I did have some comments on the whole thing, but then when you guys were talking about different senses, I was wondering if that, what, if you know anything about the stereognostic sense, either of you. About the what? Stereognostic sense. No. Put a link in the... Uh, it's the ability to perceive and recognize the form of an object in the absence of a visual or auditory information about it. Oh, that's a fascinating word. Do you know what that comes from or what field or well, who coined I learned, it? I, well, I put a, I'm trying to put a, I can't, I can't chat to everybody. I put a link in Melinda's chat. I learned about it in Montessori. And that's where we put a bunch of objects in a bag and the children know the objects like by sight and by dealing with them. But then we put them all in the bag and then they identify them. We say like, pull out the keys, pull out the, uh, the fork, whatever. But so they're having to recognize what it is without being able to see it, but they can do it because they've got a memory of it. So they're, I, you know, it's like when, when you're looking for your keys in your purse, right? You don't have to look inside your purse necessarily to find them. Yeah, that would be an example of that second level of consciousness that I called the store or the warehouse. That's where um, it's usually just called names and forms. Um, that we live in a world of names and forms. And forms have names, but all there, there are things that have names that don't have form. And the example I used a few weeks ago was the sky. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows what the sky is, and they can point at the sky, but nobody can tell you where it begins. They can't tell you where it ends. Maybe two in a hundred can tell you why it's blue in the daytime. Um, uh, so... Sky is a name, but it's not an object. It doesn't really have form or substance to it. So reality is not just forms, not just objects and forms, but names and forms. And, and to find the language is an important part of all of this. Our understanding is not limited to language, but language is a damn handy way to expand your understanding <laughs> so that's great give me that word again one more time hannah stereognostic so stereo like you would play an album on and then yeah. you can off this gnos yeah, is like knowing gnosis is knowing right right okay excellent stereognostic great okay anybody else minty not yet. I'm sure they're thinking of something. 
I wanted well, to make a comment on just some of the things I was thinking when you were in the beginning of the meditation. Sure. Because it never fails to be reminded of um, some things in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's this sentence in there where we're talking about the fellowship and it says, you know, we will surely see you on as we trudge the road of happy destiny. And everybody always says trudge the road to happy destiny and what the book says is the road of happy destiny so in other words we're already on it right we're not working our way towards it we're already there and um yeah i just i thought of that and then when you were talking about that bizarre number thing first of all i figured out that what's left after a third and a half is actually one six so that would have been a lot easier but then you would have so so it's kind of like that that 18th elephant is like a placeholder you know right, right. A placeholder and and in order to find a common denominator so it's like reality is our physical reality is like our placeholder and our common right. denominator you got it you got it yeah. For what a woman. <laughs> well, hold, hold on to it. I'll probably be calling you in an hour. <laughs> I lost it. No, I think it's it's uh, it's such a wonderful feeling to really stretch your brain, you know, and that's a brain stretcher. It's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? How does it work? And uh, we could ask questions of what. What kind of father would give half of his stuff to one kid, a third to another, and the third kid, like he only gets a ninth? That's not fair. But uh, of course, the whole story was uh, conjured up by some mathematician, and they thought, well, this this is sort of an example of the role of physical reality, which is not real and not not necessary on one hand, and yet absolutely imperative at the same time. And, and that reminds me of uh, the Confucian saying that all truth is found in paradox. If you don't, if you, if you find a truth that doesn't have a paradox standing around it and embracing it, you don't see the whole truth yet. Truth is always full of paradox. And uh, there's a certain comfort in knowing that. Your first comment, Hannah, reminds me of a mistake that is much more common and yet somewhat similar, I think, which is um, religious people who talk about loving God because God loves you. And in John, it says very clearly God is love. It does not say God loves you. It says God is love. What you make of that and how you come to understand that larger context is somewhat akin to what you're talking about being, you know, what was it on the road or going to a destination or how'd you, how'd you phrase that? Well, what the book says is we're trudging the road of happy destiny together. And what people say out loud is we're trudging the road to happy destiny. Yeah, which means that peace and love and happiness and joy is not here. You have to go someplace uh, to, to some destination and uh, love and peace and, and reality uh, is always here. It, that's what it, you know. That's what I was saying at the top of the class. There's, there's the the idea of life being a journey is a well worn allegory, and it's got a lot of value to it. We do learn, and we do gather along the way, insight and understanding. And in many ways, it makes sense to see life as some sort of journey, but the higher truth, the bigger picture. If you zoom out or rise above it all is that we're not moving through life life is moving through us and everything that we're looking for is already within us um, the game is to learn to 
have enough of an experience with the physical dense life in the material world that you begin to recognize it for what it is, close your eyes, look within, and discover the source of the movie. <laughs> you know, it's like a moviegoer to a movie theater who's never been in the projection room and never thinks twice about the fact that the whole experience of the movie is simply a reflection on the wall in front of them, but that when the movie's over, it didn't disappear. It didn't fade to black. It's still on the projector in the little room behind you. That's life. We, we look out at this physical dense world, we call it reality, when it's just a reflection and a projection. Maybe I should turn that around. A projection and a reflection of consciousness. Well, no wonder we disagree so often. Two people in the same room having what appears to be the same experience report completely different results and completely unique personal feelings about it. And then we're so dense that we argue about who's right and who's wrong. <laughs> it's like, no, it's a candy mint and a breath mint. It's both things are true. And that's a problem with the highly stressed brain. It sees everything as either or. It doesn't like both. It, it short circuits when you say both or relative, like maybe it's an 80-20. Maybe this is 80% true, but 20% of it's nonsense, or there are some exceptions to the rule over here. We have a very hard time with that, and we need to learn to be more open to that middle way, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, that third way, the the nuance, the permutations and combinations and variations. Gosh, it's so much easier to get along with disagreeable people when you honor and acknowledge, wow, that's the way you see it? That's fascinating. I, I, I sure don't agree with it. I, I, <laughs> I don't look at it that way. That's not my understanding, but... I don't need to agree with you to acknowledge, to understand and acknowledge that that's the way you see it. That's the way you see it. So be it. Okay. You know, what's so hard about that? No, no more war. No more marital dispute. And we all just get along. Yeah, but it's difficult, obviously. It's really, really hard. What's exciting is seeing humanity walking en masse, because it, actually it doesn't take everybody, right? It doesn't even take the majority. It, it just takes a small group of dedicated people to get this information and to begin to live this information and to change the way we behave and to model that equanimity and that maturity. And then people say, wow, What's that person doing? I want some of that. How come they're never rattled? How come they always seem to be happy, you know, even if they have a problem? Or uh, what are they doing that I'm not doing? I want a piece of that. That's the most subversive, radical uh, activism imaginable. Uh, to be the change that we want others to make. No, you change. I'll change after you change. <laughs> you say you're sorry, and then I'll say I'm sorry. Right? <laughs> okay, anything else, or should we wrap it up? Well, I just wondered, uh, first of all, I Googled Eben, E-B-E, and Alexander Michael Benner, and the interview did pop up on Ageless uh, Wisdom from 2021. I'm going to grab that. It sounds fascinating. You know, there's always been a dispute in the medical community when something like that happens. Is it, it is it a result of, of of a damaged brain that is showing altered images? So I'll be really interested to hear that. But I had one question for you. If, if anyone else wants to chime in, I think there might be someone. Uh, how do you avoid being discouraged with what you just said about you be the change you want to see and more and more people are embracing that uh, 
that's why I tune into your to your class to avoid just getting pulled down into it. Compassion. That's all you can do is go to compassion for the suffering of others, knowing that um, somebody who tries to frighten you or somebody who, well, let me, let me do this one step at a time. Someone who tries to frighten you is terrified. Someone who is angry at you is angry at themselves. They're hurting and they don't know why they're hurting. People don't recognize that anger is hurt and that everybody hurts. And the people who threaten you and say nasty, hurtful things to you are doing it because they're hurting. And if you have the tools that you can share with them and they're amenable to that, fine. But often they're not. They've made you the bad guy. And uh, so you're limited in your engagement with them, but you're always free to disengage, close your eyes, and go to compassion rather than trying to understand them. The only thing you need to understand is that they're suffering. It's the first noble truth. Life is suffering. You will know suffering. Everybody suffers. And you can see it in America, the fear on both sides. The more extreme the progressive, like, let's tear down the statue of Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, he freed the slaves, but he wasn't all that on board with it. He wasn't pure enough, good enough, anti-racist. So let's pull down his statue or whatever the extreme examples you want to give. There's plenty of them. Cancel culture on the far left. The farther you go into the extreme, the more fear and confusion there is. And, and, and they're terrified of the right. Well, on the right, they're terrified of the progressives. It's the one thing that the far left and far right have in common. They're terrified of each other, meaning they don't understand. The right wing is totally freaked out by unisex bathrooms and transgender this and, uh, you know, political correctness and pot smoking freaks them out. And the world is changing so fast that the so-called conservative is willing to explore fascism and autocratic and authoritarian totalitarian government if if we'll give up democracy if that's what it takes to get this crazy left stuff out of our lives and the left suffering in the same way their fear of these fascists on the right that are willing to destroy democracy and in the middle the bulk of people that can identify to some extent with both sides compassion is simply empathizing with the suffering of other people and leave it at that. Okay. Michael, we do have one more question. Sure. This is, uh, actually we have two uh, popped up. Jack says some Advaita teachers seem to denigrate the experience of anything, but the absolute, especially the sense of individuality, your thoughts. And then Anne has a quick comment after we're done. Well, Again, for those who are not familiar with the term, thank you, Jack. Advaita Vedanta is this ancient, truly ancient, pre-religious concept um, that rises out of the Upanishads and the Vedas that there's only one thing at work. There's monism as opposed to monotheism. And so, yeah, I suppose there are going to be purists who say that um, there is no such thing as individualism, uh, there's no such thing as separation, um, there's no such thing as free will. But I think a more moderate stance is found in what Buddhists refer to as the two-truth doctrine. And the two 
truth doctrine in Buddhism is that there is an absolute and there is also the relative, and both things are true. <laughs> um, the example I always give of that is temperature. You know, the, the, the story I told in my book, Fearless Intelligence, is the guy from Alaska, Joe, comes to visit me, and my friend from Hawaii, uh, Pekelo, comes to visit, and it's 68 degrees. And the guy from Alaska takes his shirt off because the weather is so warm and balmy in the Pekelo from Hawaii, he wants a sweater or a jacket. He's freezing and doesn't know how you how he's handle this cold weather. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, they're both right. That's relative truth. That's their reality. What's warm to one is cold or cool to another. The absolute truth, it's 68 degrees. And that's even, you know... What would that be, centigrade or Kelvin or some other scale? But nevertheless, it's uh, it's more objective than the subjectivity. That would be another way of talking about uh, the absolute and the relative is the objective and the subjective. Uh, the Dalai Lama knows that time is an illusion, but he wears a watch and carries a day runner and he's got a meeting scheduled for a week from Thursday at 1 in the afternoon. He'll be there, even though he knows it's an illusion that it's always now. So it's true enough. <laughs> That's the way I would say it. Um, and that would be my response to the purist that says there is only Brahman. I mean, yes, of course, there is only Brahman. There is only God. There is... All things come from that, so that's fine. But we are in a relative world, and uh, it's it's a beautiful world. It's full of flowers and sunshine and rainbows and beautiful people and children and puppies and kittens, and what more do you want? Well, Anne has a question that perfectly goes with that. So our reason for being primarily, is our reason for being <clears throat> primarily to become the best self we can be? That's from Anne. Yeah, to become more less animal-like and more godlike, to uh, to redeem not the soul. It's not the soul that needs redeeming. It's the animal nature that needs redeeming. Um, the soul is that matrix of consciousness that sits between the source, the cause, and its result, the effect between spirit and matter is consciousness, the soul, the love, the, the son between father spirit and mother matter, the Christ nature, the Christ consciousness, the Buddha nature. It doesn't need redemption. It represents love, for God's sakes. It's just, <laughs> the soul doesn't need redemption. That's just the story the church tells to get you to support the church. What needs redeeming is our fear and our ignorance and that which flows from fear and ignorance, the anger and the hatred and the divisiveness and, and the hostility and just all around grumpiness. Uh, that's what needs redemption, to learn to return a negative with something positive, to return an insult with a kindness to return confusion and animosity with peace, love, and understanding, uh, to become more godlike, to aspire to, or said another way, to bring heaven to earth. A kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only prayer Christ ever taught, uh, to bring heaven to earth, to redeem the earth. And this animal thing that's going on down here and all of its fear and hatred. Um, I always feel a little uncomfortable talking like that because my experience with animals is that uh, uh, they're much more gentle and kind and loving and, and cooperative than, you know, you might think if you see a wolf 
take down a rabbit or a lion take down a gazelle or a hawk sweep down and grab a fish or a squirrel or something. And you get real close to nature, it looks pretty ugly, pretty bloody and and pretty horrific. But uh, again, that's paradox. If you zoom out, if you stand above it all, it, it's harmony in that death and destruction can be seen as redemption. The hawk taking the rabbit, for example, well, that means the rabbit is now a hawk. The rabbit is redeemed. The rabbit can fly. The rabbit has incredible vision now. The rabbit has become the hawk. Native Americans, when they would hunt, the brave would ask the spirit of the animal that it was that that he was targeting to guide his arrow and affirm you shall live in me now that's a very different approach than the approach that the meat industry takes to growing meat harvesting meat wrapping it up in these nice little packages at the grocery store. You know, when you go to the store and you, you buy a chicken, it might be a good idea if you're eating meat to say to the chicken as you prepare it, you shall live in me and honor the chicken and honor the chicken's life. There is a middle ground in this debate between being a carnivore and being a vegetarian, which is treating all life with respect, even if you consume it. Um, so I don't want to get off on a, on a thing about vegetarianism, but I love animals. I think they're beautiful and peaceful. And I'll end with this. I'll end with this story. A buddy of mine who is still around, <laughs> both of us, we've known each other since college. I told him I wanted to take him backpacking one day because he liked to walk, but he had never gone out into the woods. He said, yeah, but I don't have any of the gear. And I said, that's okay. I'll get all the gear for you. Don't worry about it. I'll get you a, a backpack and a sleeping bag. I'll get you the right boots. And I've got the camp stove and the pots and the fuel and the canteens. We'll get everything we need. Don't you worry about it. So he shows up, and I've got everything spread out in the living room, right? The the like I say, the sleeping bags, the insulate pad, the bag goes on, the backpack, it's all laid out. He looks around and he says, where are the guns? And I said, what do you mean, where are the guns? We're not going hunting, we're going backpacking. <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, yeah, but aren't there wild animals out there? And we were just going up into the Angeles Forest above Pasadena and walk around in some of those uh, mountaintops and canyons. And But yeah, I said, yeah, there's bears up there. And there's mountain lions. And there's rattlesnakes and scorpions. And yeah, there's wild animals up there, animals that could kill you. Um. But I'll tell you, the most dangerous animal is the human being. And so the farther we get from people, the safer we'll be. I'd rather be surrounded by bears, mountain lions, and rattlesnakes than soccer fans at a game they just lost, right? Or I could pull on any one of countless scenarios of how violent humans are capable of being, especially... Uh, in a mob, January 6th, a year ago. Unbelievable, just unbelievable. The more I think about it, the more gobsmacked I am that people could do that. Use an American flag to beat up a cop and then say I'm pro-cop. Um, ah, it's just too much. So where are the guns? <clears throat> we don't, <laughs> we're going to be with animals. We don't need guns. Uh, humans are the dangerous ones. But when we talk about redeeming our animal nature, it's an animal body. It's reactive. It's reflexive. 
many times I've talked about the tendency of human beings to react reflexively and then think about it later. So as we learn to manage stress, as we do our meditation, as we slow down and relax, we can open up that space between stimulus and response. And all of our freedom and our ability to choose is in that space. Slow down. With When you don't know what to do, don't do anything. Just slow down and think and feel. And when you don't know what to say, don't say anything. Just slow down. And then you get in, increasingly familiar with that feel, uh, with that feeling of I've got to react, I've got to say something, I've got to do something, I've got to set this person straight, I've got to put them in their place. Well, I can't let them get away with that. Really? <laughs> Maybe you can. Maybe there are better ways to handle all of this. So... That's it for today. Thank you, people. Uh, if you would uh, unmute. Oh, let me just say quickly, the YouTube, uh, these videos are posted on YouTube, as you know, and we also podcast an edited version of the audio track. I cut out the meditation and the Q&A from the podcast. But uh, if you can drop a review on YouTube or the podcast on Apple Podcasts, or there's also a podcast channel called Pod Chaser that does reviews. Um, that's valuable for people who are um, using YouTube or podcasts as a way of searching. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, I miss Michael's thing on Sunday. I can catch it on YouTube or I'll just pick up the podcast. But many people, that's the first way they learn about it. So reviews, my goodness, are so helpful. You're not just stroking my ego. My ego loves nice reviews, but <laughs> beside that, uh, it, it really helps other people to find this kind. Imagine how many people are looking for something like this, a non-religious approach to this stuff drawn from all cultures and all times. And when you leave a little review, something honest and sincere, uh, that helps. So, it's Ageless Wisdom Mystery School you search for. Not Wisdom of the Soul. That's the program. Ageless Wisdom Mystery School in YouTube. Ageless Wisdom Mystery School in your podcast searcher. And uh, Google Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. And with that, let me ask you to unmute and say so long and hello and goodbye and how do you do and see you later and... Namaste, aloha, and salam. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. You too, Thanks. Melinda. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Blessings Bye. for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, people. Thank you so much.